In our penultimate um, lecture for the U.S. History Summer Course, we're going to talk about the civil rights moment of the Montgomery bus boycott. This is a pretty significant moment that frequently is seen as the start of the civil rights movement, but truly was part of the middle of a burgeoning civil rights movement that traces back hundreds of years. Montgomery was the small capital city of Alabama. The city had segregated buses, and African Americans were really beginning to challenge that earnestly during the 1950s. The Women's Political Council and the NAACP had spent a decade trying to organize resistance. On March 2, 1955, a 15-year-old Claudette Colvin was arrested for refusing to give up her seat. Colvin was not used as a symbol because she was unmarried and pregnant, which, was bo which both were highly scandalous in the 1950s. On Thursday, December 1st, 1955, however, Rosa Parks was arrested for refusing to give up her seat. She was a 43-year-old seamstress and a civil rights activist. Um, she did not plan to resist that day. But Rosa Parks had been picked um, ahead of time as to being the person to challenge um, the segregation policies in Montgomery. And really, the only thing that was spontaneous about the events of December 1st, 1955, was that she decided that it was time for it. The WPC and the NAACP mobilized around her arrest to organize a boycott. The local NAACP leader was this guy by the name of E.D. Nixon, and other groups formed what was known as the Montgomery Improvement Association. They selected Martin Luther King Jr. to be their president. Now, for us today, it's hard not to know uh, the life story of Martin Luther King Jr., but at this point in time, he was relatively unknown. Uh, King delivered a message to the meeting that spurred the community to really continue the boycott, and that is what sort of thrust him into the national spotlight. Um, one thing, if you know anything about Martin Luther King Jr., um, is the fact that he really was a gifted speaker. I mean, in terms of American orators of all time, he has to rank very high on that list. He combined Gandhi uh, techniques of nonviolence that was used in India to fight against segregation, that fight for really independence there, with black Christian faith and black church culture. King and other leaders had their homes bombed during this time. Men occupied the top leadership positions within this group, but women played an important role as well. The boycott is going to last for over a year, but it has an impressive effect on the economy of Montgomery. But that by itself was not enough pressure to end segregation all across the country, much less just in Montgomery, Alabama. Um, the movement had financial and legal aid from the North. Bayard Rustin and Stanley Levinson advised the leaders of the Montgomery Improvement Association. They also provided legal aid. An important thing to know is that it's at this point in time that the FBI began tapping Martin Luther King Jr.'s telephone and hotel rooms during this time period. They're going to continue that practice throughout the rest of Martin Luther King's life. Uh, the FBI was led by a guy by the name of J. Edgar Hoover, and he considered Martin Luther King Jr. one of the most dangerous people in this country. The city government was not going to give in to the boycott. Uh, legal court cases were working their way through the federal court system at this time, and the Supreme Court decision of Gale versus Bowder ended the boycott officially. This decision express, expre, uh, expressly overturned the Plessy versus Ferguson decision because it dealt specifically with transportation. Plessy versus Ferguson, of course, was the court case that decided separate but equal 
was constitutional, which laid the legal foundation for um, segregation. But Plessy also dealt specifically with transportation. In that case, back in the 1890s, it was train transportation and not buses as it was in 1950.